Um, this morning, I introduce Kea Desai Wingfield to you all. Um, a little note, we all experienced challenges last year and some of us turned inward and didn't leave the house and we enjoyed every minute of it. And some of us painfully craved connection and community. It was during the pandemic that I was introduced to some new friends of my own and I call them my silver lining buddies of quarantine. Kea was one of them. And the introduction went something like this. I'm brown, you're brown, we should all be friends. <laughs> and if you know, you know. So grateful to have met someone honest, strong, passionate, and loving all at once. I don't have to tell you much about her skills. Just go binge watch season seven of the Spring Baking Championship. And two fun facts about Kea. She is a black belt in karate and can tie 25 bows at machine speed in 30 seconds. So if you need any of those things, <laughs> hit her up. Most importantly, Kea is what I call a dream releaser. She dreams and then takes everyone along for the ride. And I am so personally grateful for that. Kea's culinary education is from Virginia, but the love and passion comes from Bombay where she was born and raised. Like Kea, it is complex, diverse, and definitely bold. As a mom, chef, entrepreneur, instructor, owner of Kea & Co Baking and recent winner, of the Spring Baking Championship season seven on the Food Network. Kea has a story to tell and I'm so thrilled she said yes to being with us this morning. It is a federal holiday. It is hella early and she is a mom of a toddler. So if you would join me in unmuting for a moment and giving her a warm creative mor morning's welcome. This is- Welcome Kea. Hey, Woohoo. Welcome, Kea. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, well, happy Juneteenth and happy Pride. Uh, what a beautiful month it is for so many beautiful celebrations. It's also National Chocolate Covered Everything Day, one of these days. <laughs> Just, you know, doing my, doing my bit. Um, but as you all know, my name is Kea Wingfield. Um, I am the owner of Candy Valley Cake Company and k and Co. Uh, right here in Richmond. I was born and raised in Bombay in India. It, Bombay is now called Mumbai. I'm a business owner, I'm a mom, and um, my, my message for you today revolves around self-care. Um, at any given time, if something resonates with you or if you feel like it speaks to you, please drop it in the comments. Um, I've been in Richmond for 14 years now. I moved here in 2005. Um, I came here on a very unique visa. It's called the Fiance Visa. Um, if you've seen the show 90 Day Fiance on TLC, that's exactly how I landed here. It's kind of funny because I still to this day um, wonder like what kind of algorithm did the government come up with that 90 days was the appropriate uh, number of days to marry a foreigner after he moved here. So it was just funny to me that this is how um, that kind of worked out for me. So I moved here in 2005. Um, at the end of my three months, I had to choose to either marry my husband, David, or go back to Bombay. And as you can imagine, I chose the, la chose the first. I'm still here, still married to the same guy. His name is David. Um, I also have a little cute little daughter named Uma. She's two and a half and uh, she's uh, all things sassy. Um, growing up, food is a big part of my culture. We are big foodies. We eat when we wake up. We eat after breakfast, before lunch, after lunch, before dinner. It's just a thing. It's a big, it's a big deal. So food is a big part of my family and my culture. And um, especially Bombay street food has always been a big influence for me in everything I do. Um, my mom was a wonderful cook. She, people from all over the country used to come to our house to eat what she made. Um, and my father was a scientist and an artist and a photographer and all those really beautiful complex things uh, that a person, an artist can be. Um, I also have a brother who lives in Hong Kong and uh, he's kind of like, he's kind of like an umbrella, you know, he, he's like an unbreakable umbrella in my life. So that's my family in a nutshell. Um, 
currently I'm still running Candy Valley Cake Company. Um, I have a studio in Scott's Edition um, from where I meet where I meet clients. I um, we produce food there. I have a small staff of girls who work for me, all women, uh, who were all my students. Um, in, um, in in addition to running Candy Valley for the past 11 years. I also taught at a local culinary school for nine years. I was a pastry arts instructor. Um, so that's kind of my story. I, I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm an immigrant, I'm a woman, I'm a mother. Um, and I just want to tell you a little bit more about what I do. Uh, when I first moved here, there weren't any oven, uh, you know, there were those an oven in the apartment, but growing up in India, there were no ovens in our homes. We don't bake very much. It's just not a part of the culture. So I'd never even seen an oven until I had come to the U.S. When I came here, there was an oven in the apartment. I got curious. I started baking. Um, and that's kind of where the passion for baking grew. I went to school uh, temporarily. I did like a two-year program. Um, and then it started Candy Valley around the same time. And it all just sort of culminated into this baking career for me. Um, last September, uh, fast forward to last September, I was chosen to go on the Food Network uh, on a show called Spring Baking Championship. Um, I went on the show. I won the show. Um, and here I am today, uh, trying to figure out, you know, what next? Uh, I, you know, the pandemic hit everybody really hard, right? We, we were all just kind of turned upside down and didn't know what to do. And I was one of those people as a, as a small business owner, um, the hits were pretty hard. I had to quickly pivot into figuring out what it is that I can do to keep my, um, staff employed to keep my company going. Um, and I do feel like the 10 years that I was running the business, I was sort of put into, um, I, was, I was being trained to deal with situations like that. Although nobody could have, nobody could have seen the pandemic coming, but I, I, felt, I felt equipped to be able to handle whatever that is throwing my way. Um, so we pivoted to doing, this fusiony kind of Indian street food um, catering, and that took us through those really hard months, the really really um, gritty months of the pandemic, when really all the orders fell off. We had nothing, everything, uh, all of our corporate orders, birthdays, you name it, it was all just fell off the face of the earth. So that catering really helped during that time. Um, Food to me is a very personal expression of what I do. I, it's not just um, a part of my business. It's also a part of me personally. I, I celebrate through food. I, I'm, a big, I'm a big into feeding people. Like that's, that's kind of my thing. Um, so that's, that's been my story throughout all these years. Um, on, a, on a slightly personal note, I also last year got pregnant. I was expecting a baby boy in February. Um, and so I filmed Food Network um, show while I was pregnant. And then I came back, took care of myself. Um, the business was still going, we were still pivoting, still trying to make it work. Um, and February is when I had him and um, he, he had a very rare genetic condition because of which he wasn't able to sustain life. Um, the day my food and show premiered is the day I was in an ambulance taking him to a bigger hospital to get him the help that he needed. So I literally remember at the show aired at 9 p.m. and at 8.55 I was in the ambulance and getting all these congratulatory messages about um, the show and um, it was a pretty, it was a pretty surreal, pretty surreal day. You know, Oh, when you've kind of experienced the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, you sort of start questioning, okay, what is it going to take for me to survive? Because having the title of a grieving mother is something you have to leave, live with the rest of your life. It doesn't change. It doesn't, it, do, it cannot 
be replaced. It, it is it is that title. You have to live with this now. So I've been thinking a lot about what is it that can help me get through this time. Um, another little backtrack is I've dealt with a lot of loss in my life. I lost my mom 10 years ago. It was completely sudden. Uh, we did not see it coming. Uh, she was very young. Uh, I lost my dad five years ago to a very rare tumor. So there's been this pattern of loss and um, time and again, I've been forced to kind of uh, get back up on my feet and figure it out. This time around, it's very different because I have a daughter to take care of uh, who deserves the best version of me at any given time. So what is it that I can do to maintain that? I was thinking about when was the time in my life when I was thriving? When was it that I, I was doing my best? And honestly, it was when I had my mom taking care of me, right? Um, she was um, nurturing and, and she would cherish us and she would make us all this food and she was always there. And under her, her umbrella, under her care, we were always thriving and happy um, and capable individuals. She's the reason that I'm able to do anything today. So one of my, uh, kind of like an epiphany I had a few years ago is another thing that your mama gave you is the tools to know how to care for yourself, right? Um, the best thing you can do is be your own mother. Um, if you can take care of you like your mother took care of you, you will, you will succeed. Um, now, sure, there are instances that maybe you don't have the best example of motherhood around you. Maybe you were shortchanged. And I'm truly sorry for that. But that's, you know, sort of an opportunity to recreate your narrative and become the kind of mother you would have wanted for yourself to yourself. Uh, one of the things that I do a lot is um, I'll make food the way my mother used to make food. Um, she used to make these huge meals and she usually made them for when um, family was coming over or when, you know, we had big events and things like that. Uh, but I have learned that I need to make these meals for myself. I used to always say, oh, I'm by myself. It's just me. Like, I don't want to make a four course meal, but why not? You know, why not make a four course meal for myself? Uh, because um, we deserve that. You know, the longest relationship you'll have in this life um, is with yourself. So it is really, it's really up to you to nurture that relationship, condition it, build it, uh, in the way that can sustain you for the rest of your life. Um, so that's always been um, my takeaway. After I lost my mom, I used to spend hours in the kitchen because her loss was so monumental. It was um, disorienting in so many ways. It still is. I, I just feel like losing a mother is like losing your home and it's very hard to kind of find your way back to what it can be. So I used to spend hours and hours in the kitchen uh, cooking. Um, that is kind of my therapy for it. Uh, to this day, whenever I'm cooking, I feel like she guides my hand through that process. And that's how I feel her presence. And um, it has given me some semblance of healing um, through that. Um, you know, as the chapters of my life are unfolding, I am realizing that nobody can take care of me like I can take care of me. Um, you are in charge of your own happiness. You are in charge of your own um, pathway in this life. Um, as independent as you can be for yourself, the happier you'll be. Uh, build a really solid relationship with yourself. Um, one thing I always think about is if, if a friend of mine is in distress, I will go to any length to help them, right? I will tell them all the nice things. I will tell them positive, beautiful messages, but somehow I don't do that for myself. Somehow when it comes to me, um, I put up all these walls and there's so much negative self-talk and there's so much uh, doubt and um, 
you know, the way, the way I handle myself, you know, so that's, that's a lesson that's hard that I've learned is to treat myself like I would treat my friend, like I would treat my daughter, like I would treat my husband uh, or my family, because um, that kind of self-care builds a strong um, mental health and physical health. And I, I do think that mental health is where it's at right now. Given what we've all been through over the past year, um, I always say that we're all facing the same storm, but we all have different boats, okay? Um, I personally have a tiny little canoe with four holes in it. So I'm constantly trying to plug those holes up and trying to figure out how I can stay afloat. Um, and I constantly go back to my mom. What would she do? Uh, how would she take care of me? Because that's what I need uh, to sustain the storm. Um, and, you know, I feel like the question that I keep going back to every day, uh, that I ask myself every day, is why would, why don't I do for me like I do for others? You know, we, we always hear about do unto others as you would for yourself. What does it really mean? It doesn't just mean that be nice to others. It also means be nice to yourself because um, that's where it begins. If you can't be kind to yourself, you can't be kind to anybody. Um, and that completely, completely defeats the purpose of um, us all being here. So that's kind of my um, little story for you or a little giveaway for you is ask yourself the question every day um, why can't I do for me as I do for others um, and always be your own mom always every day every single day um, be loving and be kind and be nurturing and you know keep fixing your book and once again um, Thank you so much for being here and giving me the chance to speak, uh, hearing me blab on about this. Um, I really appreciate the time. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Wow, that's beautiful. I'm pretty sure that the chat, which we will save, has all of your, your truth bombs saved. <laughs> <laughs> your nuggets of wisdom. We would love to have questions from the audience for you. So please either drop them in the chat and we will find you or raise your hand. And we would like to call on you uh, to ask Kaya some questions. Uh, while we are waiting for a first question to come in, I have a question for you. You talk about the fact that when you were, when you first came here and, you know, through hard times, you would kind of take to the kitchen and, and do that. Talk to us a little bit about how, I believe that's your creative practice. Talk to us about your creative, your creative practice. Um, I, food has been my, my guiding light in this life. So whether I'm feeding people or I'm making it for myself or my family, uh, the creativity part of it, um, I'm creating food that appeals to me and, and my little family here. So my husband is American, I'm Indian. So I'm constantly trying to make foods that bridge the gap between the two so that he's not feeling alienated and I'm not making just Indian food all the time. So that's always been my creative drive to come up with these uh, foods that are a little bit unique in the way. So that I always say that it's, it's, it's not Indian food, it's food made by an Indian. There's like a big difference between the two. Uh, but that's been, yeah, that's, that's kind of been my driving force. Can you just nuance that a little bit more? So food made by an Indian, what does that mean for you? And then Jane, I'm going to come to you next. And, uh, Tracy wants you to talk about your pop-up too. Yeah, sure. Yeah. A food made by an Indian, um, meaning that I'm from India. I grew up there. My, my roots are Indian, but my training is Virginian. So I may have all these Indian Indian influences, all these Bombay influences, but I was trained as a Southerner in Virginia. So it's always speaking to that point of view. Talk to us about your pop-up and Jane, I'm gonna to come to you and unmute you. 
Yeah, I am having a fresh mango milkshake pop up tomorrow at Tabol Brewery. If you go to my Instagram page, you'll see all the info uh, listed on there. I'll be posting about it again today. Um, my goal was to bring all these little micro dining experiences to Richmond uh, that come from my influence from Bombay. So that is this is an effort for that. Go ahead, Jane. Um, so, hi, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I actually live in Blacksburg, but I'm in Ashland for a wedding and anyway, so, <laughs> but I'm a Virginian as well right now. Um, anyway, I just wanted to know, as a working mother, I'm a working mother of, as my daughter would tell you, a six and three quarter year old uh, girl. And uh, so as a working mother, what are some of the little things you do to engage in self-care? What are the, some, how do you find the time to do little things throughout the day to care for yourself? That is a beautiful question. Um, honestly, lately what I've been doing is in the mornings when I wake up and when my daughter is up, I spend about half hour with just her. That fills me up. Like, I feel like that to me is a method of self-care because being with her, spending, just hearing her talk about Mickey Mouse or whatever, you know, all that stuff really adds up for me. And then during the day, I actually, you know, this, uh, I do this thing called one minute meditations um, where I'll just kind of stop whatever I'm doing and spend a minute just focusing on that particular, uh, um, for example, like I went to the beach lately um, and it's of course, you know, beach is so meditative, like it's a no brainer, but I literally um, sat down for a minute, did nothing, did not look at, around, didn't think about anything, just kind of cleared my head. Um, and these one minute meditations are something I'm going to post to my stories coming up because I want people to join in and kind of get to experience that with me. But great question. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. And I think my mind was blown when you said we don't have ovens in India. Like, like <laughs> I've always wondered why my mom didn't bake a million and how come all my friends know how to make cupcakes and I don't even know how to make frosting or cup like I don't know how to do those things so <laughs> so just um I guess my first question is like what what tell me what do we do in India and then also how does Bombay street food like what does that mean and how what's that fusion like when you when you kind of just talk about um I'm bringing the influences like what what's the micro <laughs> um yeah. you know eating experience in India that you've brought back in and merged it with the southern taste oh. Awesome question. So um, in India, we mostly cook on the stove top or we, we will use a microwave if need be, but stove, stove is king. A lot of our breads are made in a tandoor oven, which we don't have in our homes, but in the restaurants, they'll have them. They're like these wood burning ovens, kind of like you have the pizza ovens here. Um, so, uh, and also India does a lot of scratch cooking. So it's just not very conducive to baking. Like it's all cooking on the stove top. Um, as far as the dining experience is concerned, because my, my childhood was so beautiful, so colorful, it was filled with really inventive street food. So I wanted to bring some of these experiences here and be able to kind of share that part of my life um, and create a unique thing for you to come to, you know, like a, a milkshake pop-up that you normally wouldn't hear of. Um, it's a lot of work for me, but I'm so excited to do it and be able to kind of do something different. I call them micro dining experiences because I really hate the words pop up. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting tired of pop ups. Uh, but uh, micro dining because it's a milkshake and a, and, a, and, a, and a bag of chips. It's not a whole meal. It's, it's not a sit down dinner. It's not a buffet. It's a little teeny little nugget of a dining experience. So, okay. Yeah, I have a question for you. And if you don't want to discuss it, that's fine. Um, knowing that you touched a little bit on processing grief and kind of the creative process, can you tell us a little bit about how you use your your essence, your eunice, your your what it is that you do to to move forward? You said something like, um, I actually wrote it down. It said something, you said something about your daughter deserving the best of you. How do you make sure? that she gets the best of you? How do you process the grief through your creative process? Um, you know, I'm not going to claim to know what I'm doing. Um, when you lose a child, it's 
unlike anything else. It's not like losing a parent, which is also very unnerving, but this is com completely new territory for me. We didn't see it coming, so there was no preparation for it. Um, I think my love for her lets me put the grief aside for a bit. You know, it lets me, it, it keeps it keeps it balanced. You know, grief is a practice. You know, it's a day in and day out thing. It, it's not like I'm crying one hour and then it's over. It literally is a interwoven into your life every single day. Um, and um, my need for making sure my daughter has a good life is so high that I'm able to kind of press down that that sadness a little bit every day. And again, cooking is my is my saving grace. You know, I will when whenever I feel overwhelmed. I did. I like just the other day. I was feeling really overwhelmed. It was a very very hard day. Um, and I went to the kitchen and I made like a five course meal just for my daughter and me to have. And that is therapeutic, you know. Um, so just those little, little, there's my timer and my talk's done. Uh, but just those tiny little, <laughs> those tiny little practices of helping yourself. It's what my mom would have done for me. That's beautiful. Rupa, do you want to unmute and ask the question, your next question? Sure. Okay, yeah. Um, I think it's beautiful that you have such an amazing relationship with your mom. And like you said, some people may not have that. Um, so I wanted to know what's one thing that your mom did or said or a tradition that she had with you that yeah, that you now pass on to Uma? That's a really good question. I don't know if I'm, uh, I guess, see, if you knew my mother, she was like an ocean of love you know there was never anything that it was never based on any condition it was never based on anything so I feel like that's something I inherited from her for Uma um that I can't really pinpoint one particular thing uh but just her presence you know she was very 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 loving to everyone and she fed everyone like if you came to her house you're not leaving without eating a giant meal that's just how it was. There was um, an all day party going on in our house. Yeah, did I answer any of that? Yeah, okay. You said that you wanted to take next month off <laughs> and that you're not as good about behaving to yourself as, as you want to uh, tell other people to do. So what are some of the things that you think you're going to do uh, in the next month to ensure that you get your rest? Yeah, oh my gosh. I I'm, I always chicken out, you know, as a business owner, like you're so ingrained to just keep working, 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 working. It is very hard to turn it down or turn it off. Very, very hard. In the 11 years that I've been running a business, I have never actively taken time off ever. Um, I've never shut it down completely. It's never been that way. So I'm going to do my best to take at least two weeks. I start with a month, I'm going to do two weeks um, and I'm going to make more of those four and five course meals for myself. Great, somebody wanted to know about you winning the spring baking championship. Uh, Tracy, do you wanna unmute and ask whatever it is that you wanted to ask? Yes, I just, if you could sort of talk us through, um, I watched the show, um, was rooting for you but you know when you watch it from home and you're often wondering what's going through their heads because you're you're having to come up with this creation um I mean had you given some thoughts to what you thought you might make if you got that far I mean or was it just all in the moment making what you made um it was pretty brutal okay like <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really nice and they're wonderful people but they throw you in the deep end and that's that so many times um we had to come up with ideas on the spot based on what ingredients were available and what the theme was of that particular bake mm -hmm. um, we were never really given chance to prepare so you had like maybe 10 15 minutes when you pick like say your fruit today is a is a is an orange all right, now you have 15 minutes to figure out what you're going to do and do it and do it really well and do, do it better than everybody else. So it was pretty challenging. The one thing I have to say, um, I thought that the clock 
you know when they give you like 90 minutes to make something mm -hmm. I thought no way I'm like I'm sure you're going to stop filming at some point and you have to fix this and fix that oh no <laughs> <laughs> they're a stickler for that time like 90 minutes 90 minutes you have to be finished uh so that was the most challenging part yeah and thanks for watching and rooting I appreciate it it was a fun, fun experience. Got this uh, 90 day, 90 minute situation. Oh God, there's a theme. The theme goes. I what that theme is. <laughs> I really do want to reach out to DHS, like Department of Homeland Security. I'm like, how? How did you come up with 90 days? Talk to me. Like, what's happening? <laughs> and where is TLC? Like, I haven't heard from them yet. They're supposed to call me. That's so funny. Yeah. And Hobie's, that thing is hilarious. Yeah. Like literally at the end of the, on the 90th day, you have to pack up and leave. Yeah. yeah. And after that, they don't allow, allow you to have a work visa or a driver's license. So for a year, I was just walking everywhere uh, and not able to work. Yeah, fun time. So what are your five courses? Just okay. maybe you may not be doing that on a regular. <laughs> Look, I, I think you should do it. I think you should make a Thanksgiving meal just for yourself. Do it. I'm, I'm serious. I'm 100%. It is going to do wonders for you. Um, you are going to truly find a new level, level of appreciation for yourself. But I make Gujarati meals a lot. My mom is Gujarati. It's a part of, uh, It's a, that's the culture I'm from. So we make a lot of these like, soul filling foods like kitchari is one of them it's it's this beautiful lentil and rice porridge kind of thing um i made roti i made a vegetable i made papadum on the side the whole thing i have pictures yes can we come over can we come over that's the question no <laughs> Any given time please i'll be happy to feed everyone yeah hey, I have a question about India and being Indian about um, the fundraiser that you did recently, um, just to kind of share about what you did um, and what it was for and um, just sharing a little bit about that with you. Yeah, sure. The, so India was hit really hard with COVID in the past few months um, and they were at a shortage of everything. They needed oxygen, water, food, just feet on the ground to help people. So we did a fundraiser to raise some money uh, to provide to two organizations. One is called Kanachaye Collective and the other is Akshay Patra. And both of these are uh, grassroots initiatives that were helping the marginalized people. Uh, they were giving them food kits and waters and grocery kits. Um, so we raised uh, f about $5,000 for the whole thing. And we divvied it up between the two charities. And I hope it's, it's, you know, it's a drop in the bucket compared to what they need. Uh, but every little bit helps. And I'm so proud of this community to have helped me provide that for India. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. We did watch a lot of that. So Catherine has a question and she wanted to know um, what, oh, I just forgot it. I just lost it. What are you most proud of? Wow, Catherine. Um, my daughter. Yeah, always. I, if, if she can have a good life, I will consider myself successful. Yeah, and even, even when she's bratty and I wanna uh, put her up for adoption, she's what I'm proud for, proud of <laughs> every given time. So after you take a little bit of that much needed rest next month, and uh, you are uh, going to talk to Department of Homeland Security about the 90 day thing, um, <laughs> what else is on tap for you? I don't know. I, you know, all these years of um, kind of work, but you know, let's see what comes next and then kind of work that way. Cause it's hard to create a map or a guideline for what I do. Um, I am developing the masala chips that I sell. Um, I'm trying to develop them and get them on shelves. I'm working on that. Um, oh. Sorry. They're so good. <laughs> um, I'm also working on a, a book about grief. Um, this is a book that it will take time. Um, this is a book that I want to 
that I want to gift to everyone who's dealing with a hard time. Um, it'll have cooking that you can do like I do to help you get through this process. So those are the two main projects coming up. I mean, just little things like a book and grief and... <laughs> you know, um, these are the cards I've been dealt. That's where I am. Actually solving grief is what Sean wrote. Oh, yeah. It's um, nobody asks for it. Nobody wants it, but it's here and you can't ignore it. And um, I know, and the thing is, through this journey, I've, I've learned that so many people have reached out to me about their stories. None of us are untouched, none of us. We may have varying degrees of grief, but we're all there. Um, it's a serious thing. And the more we ignore it, the bigger monster it becomes. And it's, yeah, it's time to address it. Yeah. Lauren wanted to know, what is your favorite baked good made by somebody else? Oh, wait, other people bake? Nobody has ever baked for me, like nobody. What is that about? But uh, let's see, favorite baked good. I'll bake for you. You know, thank you. I love you, thank you. I love you already, I don't even care. Uh, make me anything, I will take it. Uh, but you know, my, my um, cooking, like my brother is a very good cook. He doesn't like to admit it. He likes to act like, oh, I don't know how to do it because he doesn't want to do it for me. But he's very good. So I will say really anything he makes. Yeah. My husband, on the other hand, can burn water, unfortunately. So yeah, it's bad. It's bad. So lucky him to be married to you <laughs> for many reasons. Uh, Gail, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Okay, uh, I'm an entrepreneur and my three wives have had some difficulty dealing with that over the years. How, how does your husband handle being married to an entrepreneur? Look, he is a champ, okay? Um, he's the reason I can do this. If it wasn't for his support, his constant, like, you can do this, you got this. He is my biggest cheerleader. Um, somehow we're making it work because we don't have a lot of family around. So with my daughter, we tag team taking care of her. She's still pretty small. She hasn't started school yet. Uh, but the bottom line is he puts up my, with my schedule. That's it. That's all there is to it. Um, he stays up late when I need him to, wakes up early when I need him to, will do a delivery when I need him to. Um, he is the mountain behind this woman. Yeah. That's beautiful. Uh, we do have room hey, for... Michelle, can I comment? I, I could not have done anything I've ever done without the women in my life. So yeah, that's very, I, I just tend to get the credit, but I know where it deserves. Where it yeah. deserves. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, you know, it's, I've been writing a lot about equity lately versus equality because women are always after equality. And I think for me, that's changed a lot. I think for me, it's more about equity because if you don't have that, you cannot sustain equality. Um, and that's something that I've learned from my husband actually. So he's the guy behind this, this machine for sure, yeah. So you have done a lot of different things for a lot of different people, Kea. What is the legacy that you are wanting to leave when, when, when you are done producing all of the wonderful things that you're producing? What's the legacy you're leaving? Uh, kindness. That's it. That's that's all I ever ask of anyone. That's all I ever have for anybody. And that's all I ever want my daughter to have. Kindness. That is it. Because you don't need anything else. If you can be loving and kind, you made it. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> Any other questions? We still have a couple of minutes. And if not, I just remembered when you said, what are the things um, you talked, you shared uh, with me a project um, that the walking dead <laughs> asked you to do. And um, I totally forgot that <laughs> question, um, but um, the walking dead was filmed in Richmond and you were um, 
asked to do some interesting things. Um, yeah. It might have been this one, or is there a crazy project that you have been asked to do that you um, can share with us just to kind of spark some creativity in us on I feel like you've done so much and it's so just matter of fact to you. So. <laughs> no, that was a really crazy because every day that director was like messaging me, hey, can you make us this icing that does not melt today? I'm like, what? And so it, it was so crazy. They would just dream up these things and I had to come up with it. Uh, they needed like this special kind of buttercream that would go through a nozzle, but not melt. I'm like, uh, it's food. Uh, it's sugar. Like, what? What do you? What do you want? Uh, so every day I was making something different for them. That was really fun. Um, and then um, I have the craziest thing you've done, or hey, it's it's it's, it's like a huge rolodex of stuff. Um, okay, we have an order coming up in July when I'm supposed to take a break um, for this gentleman who's turning 85, and apparently he loves. African blue bald monkeys. No, look it up. Look, yeah, no, it's it's it's. I'm like, what? So they <laughs> they want me to make those into cake pops, like the whole with the blue, the whole thing, and I'm perplexed. I'm, I I don't even know how to tell my staff about this. I'm like, uh, so we have to make a monkey, and it needs to have blue balls. <laughs> No, for sure. Please look up African blue bald monkey. I cannot make this up. I love, I love that I get to do these kind of creative, like out of the, out of the crazy whack things. If we were in person right now, how many people would have been cackling at that? Because, <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. That's fantastic. Please post pictures once those are done. <laughs> no, nobody, nobody. I don't, I don't, I didn't want to make it. I'm like, no, because when you have to make these kind of things, you have to research them and the pictures. Oh my God, the pictures. It's too funny. Lucy wants to know if you have any more pop-ups planned right now. Not right now. Uh, we're going to do uh, them once a month, ideally. Um, and then I want to start focusing on the, the massage trip and the book. Okay. All right, last chance. Any other last questions for Kaya before we get a message from Catherine? Uh, Catherine said, when your daughter is a bit older, what do you want her, how do you want her to describe you to a friend? Oh my God, that is a loaded question. Um, she's probably gonna say I'm crazy, that's fine. Um, I think I want her to compare me to my mom. That would be the ultimate compliment. Yeah, yeah. But first have a teacher about my mom and then we can get there, yeah. Yeah, but if she ever ever said that, that she's like, I think I would die. Like that would be the best. I think that the legacy that you're passing on is beautiful. So it sounds to me like uh, you are teaching her about your mom through everything that you do. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's the goal. Well, Kaya, thank you so very much for joining us today. It has been quite enlightening and very beautiful. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. the time and the love and really, uh, to me, your time is like the best gift I can have. Thank you so much.